Well, I'm going to follow suit and uh, step up here as well. So I'm going to come from the perspective, excuse me, I have a PowerPoint slide. I'm a visual person. And uh, I've put together, I'm going to be looking at my notes because I, uh, coming from the local perspective, uh, I also have the benefit because the governor appointed me to our state Criminal Justice Reform Commission in 2012, and I continue to serve on that. In fact, I chair the Oversight and Implementation Committee of our Reform Commission. And I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Um, but having that state perspective, let me say this, the segue into the local, is that the governor appointed me in 2012 because as he introduced the members of the team, the council, in 2013 when the first sweeping legislation was signed. Uh, he introduced me as, uh, as, as the one who was doing reinvestment and reforms since 2003. And that was the model for the statewide reform, okay? Um, and, of course, it's important to have people that are on the council that have knowledge, okay, and an appreciation and understanding for uh, reforms, best practices, and for reinvestment. So what I want to do is, is, first of all, share this with you just to give you an example and put some numbers on what Elizabeth is talking about, okay? So just to give you an idea when when CSG comes in and does this data dumping, for us it was Pew, but it's the same, okay? The formula is the same, the approach is the same. What we found out is that it cost us, on, in secure detention, $91,000 a year to house a kid, okay? And about $29,000 a year to house a kid in a non-secure facility kids who we commit to the state, judges commit to the state. But get this, this is what's really sad, is that we also found that within three years of their release from either secure detention or non-secure facilities, 65 percent went back. They reoffended, which most of those by this time had reached the age of 17, which is the adult age of criminal liability in Georgia, and we're now in adult facilities. Okay, and once you get captured in that, it's going to be, uh, you know, a continual just, you know, uh, cycle uh, for, for these people. Um, so that, that kind of gives you the, the idea, okay? We were not getting the best bang for our buck, our taxpayers' money. Uh, we were just doing a horrible job. We want to talk about race and ethnicity, uh, another big problem here. If you take a look at out of home, I mean, our population, about 34, 35 percent African American in Georgia, but yet s nearly 70 percent of the population out of home committed to the state were kids of color. All right? Very disproportionate. That was a problem, and we had to take a serious look at that. So, in a nutshell, uh, what got us to get the money at the local level, which I'm going to be talking about in more detail, is that we had to really uh, make some bright line changes, is what Elizabeth is talking about, okay? For us is that we identified that we, we had to look at the research, and the research says detention is horrible. The research is, is undisputable that if you detain low-risk kids or you allow low-risk kids to come into the system, you will make them worse and turn them into delinquents. All right? So we found out that, get this, about 40 percent of the kids that were in secure confinement were low-risk kids. We found out that about 54 percent of the kids that were in non-secure facilities were low risk. We were taking kids who probably would have just aged out of their delinquency and we turned them into criminals in adult life. That's what we were doing in Georgia. No wonder we have the highest adult probation population in the country. 
So we just said, okay, we're going to pass laws that say no longer can a judge commit a kid on a misdemeanor offense out of home unless there are three prior separate adjudicated acts of which at least one of those has to be a felony. Now, we knew then that was going to drive down the population in terms of bed space. We knew right then that was going to save us some money. Okay? And so what we did is that we then had to create that structure for reinvestment in which we identified that the monies would be placed with the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, but it would be overseen, though, by a multidisciplinary group called the Juvenile Justice Funding Committee who would establish the policies around it. How would that money be reallocated to the local control that Elizabeth is talking about? Because that's at ground zero. That's where the real work is done. Okay? We also passed a law that those monies have to go to, must be invested, reallocated to evidence-based programs and practices. Okay? We cannot, we cannot convince people to support this unless there's a sound practice in place that we're going to invest in only those things that we know have been studied and they work to reduce recidivism. All right? And of course, we, we now mandated all these assessments. Judges cannot commit a kid unless that kid has been assessed for risk and needs. A kid can no longer go into detention unless that kid's been assessed to determine whether they're high risk and, they des and, and it's necessary for protection of the community at that moment to put them in detention. Uh, and, and just as Elizabeth said, you, she, look, some of the things that we're doing, th these programs right here that are evidence-based programs you see on the screen, multi-systemic therapy, functional family therapy, thinking for a change, aggression replacement training, seven challenges, none of them existed in the state of Georgia before reforms. None of them. Because we were putting most of our money in brick and mortar. And brick and mortar doesn't change one's cognition. You cannot punish the symptoms. You have to treat the underlying causes that will remove the symptoms, which is your disruptive behavior in your delinquency. Delinquency is a manifestation of something else. We got to figure out what that something else is. And that's what evidence-based programs do. Okay? So with that said, to give you an idea, you could see already in 2000, fiscal year 14 and 15 how many out-of-home placements we've now you know, uh, reduced, okay? If you look at these numbers right here, that's a lot. And so for Clayton County, as I, as, and by the way, we've already, we've already closed three facilities in Georgia. All right? Three facilities. We don't need them. Because we're now reinvesting in programs that work and we can keep kids in the community because that's where the real rehabilitation occurs is with the families at home. That is an evidence-based characteristic. You cannot rehabilitate, okay, unless you're with the family. And these families don't have the means, because most of them come from poor communities, to travel to these far-out places of Georgia where their kids are being housed. Now, you can see as, the, as, as we are closing beds that, the, that, that we're getting the reinvestment money increases. So, so, for example, you're looking at about 200,000 here the first year, about 400, it's about 409,000, it's about 409,000 here as well. And then this year, we got, we received about $700,000 in monies that we never would have had in the first place, now going to evidence-based programs, treating these kids. Now, I'm going to tell you, this is, this is my Bible. So for the last four years working on the Criminal Justice Reform Commission, I've taken some pretty copious notes about what works in terms of creating an algorithm for juvenile justice systems. And really, Elizabeth has summed it up. I just happened to put it in a mapping here, OK? But the bottom line at the local level, and what we did began, so 2002 is our baseline year. And you're, I'm going to show you some numbers as I close. But this algorithm to reduce recidivism in juvenile justice, which, by the way, must include, that often is not thought of, 
is the concept of prevention. All right? In other words, in other words how many of those kids that are out there, outside my front door, the juvenile court, are at risk of coming in my door, and how can I identify those kids? What mechanisms and tools can I use to identify those kids and deliver strategic services targeting, targeting those kids at risk? I want you to know we use the epidemiology approach. Speaking of, by the way, improving health populations, you know, the epidemiology model of studying diseases, you identify the at-risk population, those populations at risk of contracting a disease, you study them. What are the characteristics that place them at risk so you can, you're in a better place to develop the solutions? All right. Well, think about this. There are two basic epidemiological facts that underscore this model. Diseases don't occur by chance, right? Diseases are not randomly distributed. Well, I want you to replace the word disease with disruptive behaviors. Disruptive behaviors do not occur by chance. They are not randomly distributed. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, they can be studied as well. And so that means that even in a preventive way, we can increase the reduction in, in recidivism. And it's not so much recidivism, but re reduce the population of people entering the door that, would, that we even have to consider about reducing their risk of recidivating by not placing them in that position that we have to consider them as a recidivist statistic, all right? And, and so how we do that is we targeted the schools. Well, wait a minute, that's low-hanging fruit. We have compulsory attendance laws. Kids have to go to school. So we partnered in 2003 with our school system Lavinia Jackson, our current school superintendent, was then the assistant superintendent, who, by the way, is brilliant and a genius and a visionary. Um, and I was, it was a, she was a godsend at that time um, that to, to, to have this partnership. And so the first thing we did is we said, okay, we need to stop treating the symptom. We need to reduce suspensions. We need to reduce arrests because we know that the research says that hurts the kids. I mean, who'd ever think that keeping kids in school would increase graduation rates, right? <laughs> and you know, and as goes graduation rates, so goes crime. It just follows. And so that's what we did. We created the country's first school justice partnership, and to this day, school arrests are down 91%. And we replace them now with um, alternatives that are restorative justice in practice. And how it's now evolved is that all misdemeanors are banned from being uh, referred to the juvenile court, including possession of drugs that are misdemeanors. Instead, we treat the kids, we assess them, we do random drug check. And guess who partners in that? The juvenile court. I extend my services to non-court involved kids so they will never become court involved. By having my court officers go out there discreetly and help them with those kids. And we have all types of restorative justice program, peace circles, mediation, drug testing, drug assessment, boundaries, drug education. You, I mean, I can go on with the list. Now the school system, through their, the school resource officers, have a direct referral to our restorative justice division at the court without having to arrest a kid at no cost to them. But we also, so this is our algorithm here. The first thing is that, you know, the youth commits a delinquent act. Is it at school? Okay, well, if so, is it a focus act? That would be a misdemeanor. If it's yes, notice it never enters the court. It goes up here straight to diversion, restorative justice. But I don't have time to go through this. Suffice to say that there are release valves all throughout here. We find every way to get the kid off the delinquency pathway into a more appropriate pathway that strategically addresses the underlying causes of that delinquent act that they committed. Even the kids who are eligible for commitment, we've created what is called a deep end program for those kids called the Second Chance Program, uh, which Pamela is very familiar with from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. In fact, you can see the document that they published okay, on the Second Chance Program, if you Google Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, 
and, and, uh, and the system of care. One other thing that we've done is that we realized that these alternatives we created for these disruptive kids were not working for the chronically disruptive kids. So in 2010, we got together and we created what is called the Clayton County System of Care. We realized that these kids were likely in need of clinical type of services instead of educational based alternatives. And so it's a 501c3 and it is a blending of funding from, with the public and private. In fact, Kaiser Permanente now gives money because they see it as the means to lower health cost because it's increasing graduation rate. So what we've done is we've basically uh, looked at the, the kids who are dropping out of school, developed their profile, what do they look like? Why are they dropping out of school? Remember the epidemiology model, okay? And then we brokered all those types of evidence-based programs through the system of care. So the school now refers the chronically disrupted instead of, instead of suspending and expelling them, and these are the kids who will drop out of school. Instead, they referred them to the system of care, and, this, and there's a single point of entry called the Clayton County Collaborative Child Study Team, and they travel every week, multiple times during the week, to all the schools across the county, and they assess the family and the child and the student with a risk needs assessment, trying to identify the underlying causes, and then get into their homes where the schools can't with these services. Ladies and gentlemen, the number one cause, the referral, is trauma. 87%, you know, using the ACEs scoring, 87% score high for trauma. Most of it related or associated with poverty, okay? So I want you to know this. Their grades have improved in language arts, math, and science. There's been an 87% decline in disciplinary referrals among this population. And we're now beginning to see the first cohort graduate from high school who would never graduate from high school in the first place. And that would explain that since we created the School Justice Partnership in 2003, every year our graduation rates, which at the time that we started it was at a low 58%, okay, every year has increased. In fact, the year before last, Clayton County posted the highest increase in graduation rates in all Metro Atlanta. Last, so let me just finish up with this. Real quick, that is our crime right now, juvenile crime rate is that blue line. It's down 71%. As goes kids, so goes adults. If you want a better adult population, then invest in your kids in the right way. Oh, I, I failed to mention, by the way, the school board has now given nearly half a million dollars to the system of care. And they're doing it because it reduces their administrative costs. So now they give $400,000 for direct services and they let the system of care administer the $400,000 for direct services to their chronically disruptive kids. And they're reaping the benefits. Annual emissions declined by 66%. Now this is all baseline year, 2000, uh, 2002, okay? With a lower recidivist rate among those kids waiting to come back. The average length of stay for those kids who have to be detained is 44% 40, decline. The, um, the average daily population is now reduced by 80%. It was 72 in 2002, today it's 12.36 or something, 12.12 12 out of a 60 bed facility. So there's a lot of empty beds if it was just Clayton County youth. In fact, the Department of Juvenile Justice who manages these institutions are now putting kids from other counties in there. 83% decline in number of probationers, 78% decline in total violations filed, 93% decline in VOP warrants. We do not issue bench warrants for kids anymore. We use Alexander Graham Bell's great invention, we use the telephone to call them. I mean, who would ever think, okay, all right? There's your visual of your school arrest, your demographics, look at this, okay? Look what we've done. That's the thing about the zero tolerance policies is they hurt kids of color. They were intended, the, the argument is that they, they are race neutral, that is a lie. They're only as good as the people who are applying them and that's the problem. So you could see 
there, in terms of filings on kids of color, the dramatic reduction, okay? And there's your increase in graduation rates. That was the change in the formula. Remember in 2011, 12, the Fed's now required on time. But the po point, point is, it's gone up every year. Our commitments are down. 73% decline in kids being placed out of home out of Clayton County. We keep, we're keeping them in the community. And as you know, um, and, and I've already mentioned about the system of care. So I'm going to leave it at that. I've already talked about these things. I just want to, and oh, by the way, the, these kids who were on a trajectory to drop out, their attendance is up 62%. It's all about school climate. It's about how you treat kids. It's about relationships, okay? Stop punishing the kids. You're punishing their symptoms, all right? Um, and their impact on grades. One last comment. There are seven core strategies I want to share with you that I have learned at the local level that also applies at the state level, and Elizabeth has pointed them, but I put them into terms. I'm going to leave you with these thoughts, okay? Number one is this. You need to have a champion or champions who have the characteristics of a convener. You know, um, vision, legitimacy, stakeholder knowledge, subject matter knowledge. For us at the statewide, it was the governor. At the local level, it was me and my school superintendent. We were co-champions, okay? Uh, you, then you have to use the research, all right? Uh, what works in your field or subject matter, okay? And then number three, using these best practices, create a systemic algorithm. Take a look at what these best practices can do and where so that you know where you're going to save cost, where you're going to save money, like that algorithm that, that I had up here on the screen. I would suggest, number four, use an incremental approach, okay? You must make the change before you can realize the savings for reinvestment toward best practices and programs. But there's something that's very important. Sometimes you might have to invest to reinvest, okay? So for example, I, uh, uh, one, by way of analogy, when I was a teenager, my, my, my dad told me at 16, my first car, now son, you're 16, you're neurologically wired to do stupid things, so look, um, you're probably gonna run out of gas. When you go get the gas can, uh, and you don't pour all the gas into the tank, leave a little bit to put into the carburetor, or else, doesn't matter how much gas you put in there, you'll never get it started. Well, that's what we did. The governor put in $5 million, asked the legislature for, for an investment of just $5 million that was dedicated to the highest committing counties, okay, to get them these evidence-based programs that we can start. So, so you've got to understand, you can pass all the laws you want that's going to reduce the bed space, but what are you going to do with those kids you're keeping in the community? And so that's what the governor wanted to do was use that little bit of gas to start that engine, okay? All right. Fifth, and I'm almost done, quality control mechanisms. You create an oversight and implementation, okay? Because this is the, the failure to do this is the one thing that will kill reinvestment. You gotta keep it alive. You gotta keep looking at it. You gotta keep tweaking it, okay? And then there must be a sustainability plan. For us, it was creating the Criminal Justice Reform Commission, which is a statutory creature, which I, I serve on, okay? And that we continue to look at what's going on, and we meet periodically. We just met last week, and I'm gonna tell you, it's a big meeting, everyone shows up, okay? Um, number seven, that's also good, public relations. You wanna keep it in the heads of your legislators, your bureaucrats, your administrators. You wanna keep it alive, that this is a meaningful thing. And then, so, so lastly is the political will. We've, we've talked about political will, but you know, if you do all those things, you'll have the political will. I wanna tell you something right now as I close. We now have legislators who asked to get on our agenda at the Criminal Justice Reform Council seeking support from us because everything that we have submitted to the legislature has passed unanimously except for this last year there was this one nay vote but it was only for one little issue and that legislator was quite apologetic about it. Okay, all right. And this is a Republican controlled Senate and House on matters that look soft on crime, but they're not, ladies and gentlemen, they're tough on crime because it increases public safety because you're using evidence-based practices, okay, and it saves money and it strategically invests where it needs to be invested because that's what we should be doing. Thank you.